Welcome to chapter 3 of the Bolton book, The Room Where It Happened, and I'm going to tell you about the title of this chapter, and it's called America Breaks Free. On Monday after the Syria attack, I flew with Trump to Florida, talking, taking my first right on Marine One from the South Lawn to Joint Base Andrews, and then Air Force One to Miami. Our destination was nearby Kalia for a rally beast, boosting Trump's effort to create a positive business climate. The over 500 strong audience consisted largely of Cuban and Venezuelan Americans, and when Trump introduced me in the context of the Syria strike, I got a standing ovation. Trump, obviously surprised, asked, are you giving them all the credit? You know that the means to the end of his job. What fun. Senator Marco Rubio, however, had foreshadowed the ovation earlier when he raised my appointment as National Security Advisor. It's a bad day for Maduro and Castro, and a great day for the cause of freedom. I had long worked on these issues, and the crowd knew e e even if Trump didn't. Air Force One flew afterward to Palm Beach, and then we motorcaded to Mar-a-Lago. I continued preparing the Trump's summit with Japanese Prime Minister Abe, with a heavy focus on North Korea's nuclear weapons program, the main purpose of Abe's trip. Even with the simple task of preparing Trump for Abe's visit turned out to be arduous and a sign of things to come, we arranged two briefings, one largely on North Korea and on security issues, and one on trade and economic issues, corresponding to the schedule of the meetings between Abe and Trump. Although the first Abe-Trump meeting was on political matters, our briefing room was filled with trade policy types who, having heard there was a briefing, wandered in. Trump was late, so I said we would have a brief discussion on trade and then get on to North Korea. It was a mistake. So Trump set off by a comment that we had no better ally than Japan, jarringly complained about Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor. Things went downhill from there. Before long, Abe arrived, and the session ended. I pulled Kelly aside to discuss the fruitless briefing and he said, you're going to be very frustrated in this job. And I said, no, I'm not. If there are minimal rules of order, there is not a Trump problem. This is a White House staff problem. I don't need a lecture from you, Kelly shot back. And I replied, I'm not lecturing you. I'm just telling you the facts. And you know it's true. Kelly paused and said, it was a mistake to let them, the trade people, in. And we agreed to fix the problem next time. But in truth, Kelly was right and I was wrong. And, the, and it was a Trump problem. And it never got fixed. Abe and Trump first had a one-on-one -on -one meeting, and then they and their delegations convened in Mar-a-Lago's white and gold ballroom, which was indeed very white and very gold. At 3 p.m., Abe greeted me by saying, welcome back, because we had known each other for over 15 years. As it was a typical as such meetings, the press mob stampede in, cameras rolling. Abe explained that during the one-on-one, -on -one, he and Trump had forgot forged a mutual understanding that all options were on the table regarding North Korea, where we needed maximum pressure and the threat of overwhelming military power. Certainly, this was my view, although the very moment Pompeo was busy negotiating where Trump's summit with Kim Jong-un would occur, the Abe visit was perfectly timed to stiffen Trump's resolve not to give away the store. After the media shuffled reluctantly out, Abe and Trump had a lengthy discussion on North Korea that turned the trade issues. While this meeting continued, the press was exploding on something else. In the hectic hours before the Syria strike, Trump had initially agreed to impose more sanctions on Russia. Moscow's presence in Syria was crucial to propping up Assad's regime and perhaps facilitating or at least allowing chemical weapons attacks and other atrocities. Afterward, early Saturday morning, and we could hit them harder if we need to be later. Moreover, the U.S. had imposed substantial sanctions on Russia on April 6, as required by the Countering America's Adversaries Through Sanctions Act, which Trump detested because R Russia was its target. Russia believed that acknowledging Russia's meddling in U.S. politics or that of many other countries in Europe and elsewhere would implicitly acknowledge that he had colluded with Russia in the 2016 campaign. This view is wrong as a matter of both logic and politics. Trump could have a stronger hand dealing with Russia if he had attacked it on its efforts at electoral subversion rather than ignored them, especially since the concrete ac actions such as economic sanctions taken by his administration were actually quite robust. As for the assessment of Putin himself, he had never offered an opinion, at least in front of me. Never I asked about Trump's view was, perhaps I was afraid of what I might hear. This personal take on the Russian leader remained a mystery. I tried to persuade him to proceed with new sanctions but he wasn't buying. I said Mnuchin and I would make sure the Treasury didn't make any announcements. 
Fortunately, since many senior officials were all too familiar with the roller coaster ride of administration decisions, there was a built in pause before Trump's initial approval of the new sanctions that would actually be carried out, and there was a final no go decision. Um, that would be made on Saturday. So I told Ricky Waddle, McMaster's deputy, and still on board, to get the word out to stop any forward motion. NSC staff and for Treasury first, then all of others, and Treasury agreed it would also alert everyone that sanctions were off. On the Sunday morning talk shows, however, Haley said Treasury would be announcing Russia sanctions on Monday. Immediately, there were red flags and alarm bells. John Lerner, Haley's political advisor told Waddle that the U.S. mission to the U.N. in New York knew the orders on the Russia sanctions and he said that Haley just slipped, a breathtaking understatement, magnetic attraction to television cameras, a common political ailment had created the problem, but it was also the process foul. The sanctions were for Treasury to announce. The ambassador to the U.N. had no role to accept, in this case, mistakenly stealing the limelight. Trump called me at 6.30 p.m. to ask how the Sunday shows had gone, and I told him that the Russia mistake and what we needed to do to fix it. Yeah, what's up with that? Trump asked. This is too much, I explained. What Kelly had what Haley had done, and Trump said, She's not a student, you know. Call the Russians and tell them. Then I did, ringing Moscow's US ambassador, Anatoly Antonov, whom I knew from the Bush forty three administration. Shortly thereafter, I was t- I wasn't about to tell him what actually happened, so I just said Haley had made an honest mistake. Antonov was a lonely man, since people in Washington were now afraid to be seen talking to Russians. So I invited him to the White House to meet. This pleased Trump when I later debriefed him, because this is how we could start talking about the meeting he wanted with Putin. I also filled in Pompeo on Haley in the day's Russia events, and I sensed over the phone calls that he was shaking his head in dismay. Notwithstanding the Moscow was calm, the U.S. press on Monday was raging away of the Russia sanctions victory. Trump gave Sanders press ca- guidance that we had hit Russia hard with sanctions and we were considering more, hoping that would be- stop the bleeding caused by Haley's statements. I spoke to the state's acting secretary, John Sullivan, who agreed state bore some generic responsibility. Since the Tillerson-Haley days, there had been essentially no communication between the state or our UN mission in New York. Haley was a free electron, which she had obviously gotten used to, communicating directly with Trump. I'm told Sullivan of the screaming matches between Al Hagan and Gene Kirkpatrick in the early days of the Reagan administration, and Sullivan laughed. At least they were talking. By Tuesday, the press was still baying away. Haley called me at 9.45, worried about being left out on a limb. I'm not going to take it. I did not want to have an answer for it. She denied or... She or the U.S. mission had been informed of the Saturday rollback. I said I would check further, even though her own staff had admitted on Sunday it had been a huge misstep. I had to ask Waddle again to check in with Treasury, which he was getting tired of being blamed. They emphasized that they made clear to everyone on Friday, including the UN ambassador's representative, that whatever Trump's decision not announcement would be made until Monday morning, just before U.S. markets open. I thought that it would be a telling point. Treasury also confirmed that he called around on Saturday on the NSC staff what they had done to follow up. And anyway, why should our UN ambassador make the announcement? Waddle went spoke again to Haley A. John Lerner, who said she shouldn't have done it. It was a slip of tongue. Meanwhile, Trump grossed about how the press was spinning what was, without doubt, a reversal of policy. How the press was spinning what was, without doubt, a reversal of policy because he worried it would make him look weak on Russia. The wildfire, however, was about to break on another front. Larry Kudlow briefed the press on the Trump-Abe discussions. Sanders wanted me to join Kudlow, but I chose not to. For the same reason, I declined to go on the Sunday talk shows. I didn't see the point in being a TV star in my first week on the job. In a live coverage of Kudlow's briefings, asked about the inevitable question of the Russia sanctions, Kudlow said that there had been some momentary confusion and then made the points that Trump had dictated to Sanders on Air Force One. He... Haley immediately fired off a message to Fox's Dana Perino, with all due respect, I don't get confused, and boom, the war was on again. At least for a while, Haley got a good book title out of this incident, but with all due respect, Haley wasn't confused, she was wrong. After Trump and Abe golfed on Wednesday morning, there was a working lunch largely on trade matters, which had not begun until 3 p.m. The two leaders had a joint press conference and a dinner between the two delegations started at 7.15. A lot of food in a short period. I flew back to Washington on the First Lady's plane, considering the summit a real success and a substantive issues on the, like North Korea. 
My focus now, however, remained on Iran and the opportunity presented by next sanctions waiver decision. On May 12th, to force the issue of withdrawal, Pompeo had called me into Florida on Tuesday evening to spun up what it was to do on the Iran nuclear deal. I couldn't tell if he was still wired after his difficult confirmation process, which was entirely understandable, or if he had just been played by the people at stake who were getting increasingly agitated that we might actually withdraw. After a difficult, sometimes testy back and forth, after the inevitable criticism from the high-minded withdrawal decision would cause, Pompeo said that he would have state think more thoroughly about why would we should follow from our exit, something they had adamantly resisted uh, don't, doing so thus far. I worry that Pompeo's evident nervousness was blowing away the Iran nu nuclear deal could lead to even more delay, knowing the state's bureaucracy could seize on the in indecisiveness to instruct the demise of yet another hollowed out yet yet another hollowed out international agreement. Hesitation at the administration's political level could be fatal. Trump staying in Florida for the next of the week, but back in Washington, I focused on Iran. I had long believed that Iran's nuclear threat, while not as advanced operationally as North Korea, was as dangerous, potentially more so because of the revolutionary geological obsessions motivating it, its leaders, to Iran's nuclear program as well as the chemical and biological weapons work, and its ballistic missile capabilities made it both a regional and global threat. It was already tense in the Middle East. Iran's progress in the nuclear field inspired others, Turkey, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, to take ultimately con consistent but having their own nuclear weapons capabilities. Evidence of the proliferation phenomenon at work. Iran also took dubious distinction of being the world central banker of international terrorism with an active record, particularly in the Middle East, of supporting terrorist groups with weapons and finance, and by deploying its own conventional military capabilities in foreign countries in its aid of strategic objectives. And after 40 years, the fervor of Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard showed no signs of abating, and its political and military leaders I have met with said with Mark Sedwell and my German counterpart Jane Hecker, and spoke at length with Francis Felipe Anton. While I repeatedly made no decision that had been made, I also tried every way possible to explain there was no avenue for fixing the agreement as the State Department had pleaded for over a year. For all three of my counterparts and their governments, this was hard news. That was why I kept repeating it, knowing, at least hoping, that Trump would withdraw from the deal in a matter of weeks. The news would be a thunderclap. I wanted to be certain I did everything possible so our closest allies were not surprised. With imminent visits to the White House by Macron and Merkel, there was ample opportunities for a full discussion on the issues, but they needed to know in advance that this time Trump meant to get out, probably. I expected, despite his wobble when I was at Mar-a-Lago, that Pompeo would still instill some discipline into the state, but he had run into a confirmation problem with Rand Paul. Paul eventually declared support for Pompeo in exchange for Pompeo, saying that the 2003 Iraq war had been a mistake, and at least according to the Paul tweet, that regime change was a bad idea and that he that we should withdraw from my Afghanistan as soon as possible. I felt sorry for Pompeo because I was sure those weren't his real views. I was never faced with the having to recant my views in order to get a vote or even to get faced with the national security job from Trump. So I never got to make the decision Pompeo faced. States John Sullivan told me later that day about his courtesy call with Paul during the confirmation process. Paul had said he would vote for Sullivan for one reason only, your name is not John Bolton. Kelly had also told me that in a course of the Pompeo negotiations, Paul was the worst fucking decision Trump had made. Kelly replied, he had been a nice guy to me, which set Paul off in another tirade. It all made me proud. During all those hectic first weeks, I also participated in several trade-related meetings and calls. I was a free trader, but I agreed with Trump that many international agreements reflected not true free trade but managed trade and were far from an advantageous to the U.S. I particularly agreed that China had gamed the system. It pursued mercantilist policies in the supposedly free trade world trade organization, all the while stealing U.S. intellectual property and engaging in forced technology transfers that robbed us of incalculable capital and commerce over decades. Trump agree understood that the strong domestic U.S. economy was critical to the effective projection of U.S. and military power. Not as I began to understand that he wanted to do much projecting, which percept applied to China and everyone else. And I also had no truck whatever with WTO decision-making and adjudication processes that were intended to sub 
assume national decision making. I was completely agreeing on the point of the U.S. Trade Representative Bob Lighthizer and form, former colleague of Covington and Burlington, who had been associates together in the mid 1970s. Decision making on the trade issues under Trump, however, was painful. There could have been more, a more orderly path using the NSC's intricacy structure, cohered with Kudlow's National Economic Council, to develop a trade policy option. But there was only one person who thought that this was a good idea, me. Instead of the issues were raised in weekly meetings, chaired by Trump in the Roosevelt Room or the Oval, that were more closely resembled college food fights than a prepared, careful decision-making, with no lower-level integrity efforts to sort the issues and the opinions. After these sessions, I had believed in yoga. I probably could have used some. I attended my first trade meeting in late April in preparation for a Mnuchin Lighthizer trip to Beijing. I allowed... Tr I Trump allowed us as how tr tariffs are a man's gr best friend, which was chilling. But at least he said to Mnuchin, you're going to get China to kick their ass. That I liked. Looking at me, Trump said China was strictly enforcing sanctions against North Korea because they feared a trade war with us, which was only partially correct. In my view, China was not strictly enforcing sanctions. Mnuchin and Kudlow predicted a global depression if a real trade war happened. But Trump brushed them aside. The Chinese don't give a shit about us. They're cold-blooded killers on trade. I could see the trade issues would be a world, a wild ride. Macron arrived on April 4th for the administration's first state visit, replete with a ceremony that would have impressed even the French. Sadly for the press, nothing went wrong. The French and U.S. delegations lined up on the South Lawn with the President and First Lady in the diplomatic reception room, waiting for Macron to arrive, and the military bands started playing away. I asked Dunford at one point for the name of the songs, and he asked the Washington Military District's commander. But neither of them knew. Another disappointment, said Dunford, and we both laughed. The military pageantry was impressive, especially when the Old Guard Fife and Drum Corps, dressed in Revolutionary War uniforms, marched in review playing Yankee Doodle. It made up for a lot of bureaucratic agony. Before the Macron Trump one on one in the Oval, the press mobs shambled in the customary pictures and questions. Trump characterized the Iran deal as insane, ridiculous, and the like. I wondered if this people would take it seriously. With the press cleared from the Oval, Trump and Macron spoke alone for much longer than expected, the bulk of which consisted, as Trump told me later, of his explaining to Macron that we were exi exiting the Iran deal. Macron tried to persuade Trump not to withdraw, but failed. Instead, Macron worked to ensnare Trump in a large negotiation fra framework of four pillars. That was discussed in the expanded meeting in the cabinet room after one-on-one, -on -one, the four pillars being handling Iran's nuclear program now, handling it tomorrow, Iran's ballistic missile program, and the regional peace and security. Macron was a clever politician, trying to spin a clear defeat into something that sounded at least somewhat positive from his perspective. Speaking almost entirely in English during the meeting, he said unambiguously, unambiguously about the agreement no one thinks it's a sufficient deal agreeing that we should work for a new comprehensive agreement based on four pillars during the meeting trump asked my opinion of the Iran deal i said it wouldn't stop iran from getting nuclear weapons and that there's no way to fix the deal's basic flaws knowing trump's penchant to deal on anything i mentioned eisenhower's famous observation if you can solve a problem enlarge it and i said i thought that the war that that was what Macron seemed to be doing. It was something we could explore after withdrawing and reimposing U.S. sanctions, which Mnuchin affirmed it was completely ready to do. Said Trump, the builder, you cannot build a bad foundation. Kerry made a bad deal. I'm not saying what I'm going to do, but if I end the deal, I'm open to making a new deal. And I'd rather try to solve something than leave it like it is. We should, he said, get a better deal and a new deal rather than fixing a bad deal. But Kron told Trump in a subsequent call that he was eager to rush to find a new deal, which didn't produce any resonance with Trump. The meeting then turned to trade and other issues and broke at around the 12.25 o'clock to prepare for a new joint press conference. At the event, neither leader had much or new to or different to add on Iran, although at one point... Trump observed, nobody knows what I'm going to do, although, Mr. President, you have a pretty good idea. 
Later, the black tie steak dinner was pretty nice if you like eating until 10.30 at night. Even at that, Gretchen and I skipped the subsequent entertainment as did John Kelly and his wife, Karen, who ran and all picked up briefcases and work clothes from our offices on the way home. The preparations to leave the deal took a giant step forward with Mattis agreed on April 25th. If you decide to withdraw, I can live with it. Hardly an enthusiastic endorsement, but at least signaled that Mattis wouldn't die on the ditch over it. Even so, Mattis extensively re restated his opposition to withdraw every chance he got, to which Trump said resolutely a few days later, I can't stay in. That was a definitive statement, and a few days later, I, um, leaving, Later in the morning on April 25th, Trump again emphasized to me that he wanted Mnuchin fully ready with the heaviest possible sanctions when we exited. I also met in the morning with Antan, and my clear impression was that Macron had not briefed the French side fully on the one-on-one -on -one with Trump. This was excellent news, since it meant that Macron fully understood that Trump had told them what we were going to withdraw. The trump Merkel of April 26th, 7th summit was a working visit, rather than a state visit, so not as grand as Macron's. Trump's one-on-one -on -one with Merkel lasted only 15 minutes before the larger cabinet room meeting, which he opened by complaining about Germany feeding the beast, meaning Russia, through the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Moving on to the European Union, which he thought treated the U.S. horribly, it was clear to me that Trump thought Germany's was Russia's captive. Also, Trump used a line I later heard countless times, the EU is worse than China except smaller, adding that the EU was set up to take advantage of the US, which Merkel disputed in English as the whole meeting was. She also asked for three to four months delay in imposing global steel and aluminum tariffs, which Trump was considering so that the EU could negotiate with the US. Trump answered that he didn't want to negotiate with the EU, too bad because he didn't feel the way about North Korea. I thought to myself, Trump had already turned to Germany's failure to meet NATO commitment to increase defense expenditures to 2% of GDP, describing Merkel as one of the greatest tap dancers on the NATO question, which he was now doing on trade. Merkel kept pressing for an extension even two months on tariffs, but Trump said that he would be that would be a waste of time, just like NATO. He asked when Germany would reach 2%. Merkel answered 2030 innocently, which caused even Germans to smile and Trump to say that she had been saying the same thing for 16 months. On tariffs, Merkel finally said she could do whatever he wanted because he was a free man. Mention of Iran was desultory. Merkel asked us to stay in the deal and Trump reacted with indifference. At the press event, Trump said of Iran, they will not be doing nuclear weapons and that was pretty much it. Possibly more eventful was yet another another putative Israeli attack on Iranian positions in Syria that day after, which Mattis and other Pentagon officials worried could prompt Iranian retaliation, probably through surrogate Shia militia groups in Iraq on U.S. forces. Nothing happened, and in any event, Trump seemed unconcerned. Briefing Netanyahu on his Iran thinking, Trump said that the whole deal was based on lies. Iran had played on the United States for fools, and that Israel should feel free to flay the deal publicly, which of course Netanyahu was already busily doing. As the days went by, I quietly confirmed with Mnuchin, Haley, Coates, Haspel, and others that the that everything was pointed to an early May withdrawal from the Iran deal, and that all we needed to do was think about the decision's appropriate rollout and following steps in our respective areas. Mnuchin insisted that he needed six months to get the sanctions back in place, which I couldn't understand. Why not make the reimposed sanctions effective immediately with some short grace period, like three months, to allow businesses adjusting to adjust existing contracts and the like. This was a perennial problem with Treasury under Mnuchin. He seemed to be concerned with mitigating the impact of sanctions as with imposing them to begin with. No wonder Iran, North Korea, and others were so good at evading sanctions. They had plenty of time to get under Mnuchin's approach, which was in essence the same as Obama's. Pompeo agreed with me that the sanctions should take immediate effect. We did score in a small victory when Mnuchin reduced the wind-down period on most goods and services from 180 days to 90 days, except for oil and insurance, which he kept at 180 days. Of course, oil, the overwhelmingly most important economic issue at stake. So Mnuchin's retreat was hardly significant. And we were not talking just about winding down existing contracts, but a grace period within which new contracts could be entered and performed with no prohibition at all. It was unnecessarily self-defeating. Pompeo and Mattis and I had our first weekly breakfast 
at the Pentagon on May 2nd at 6 a.m., and Mattis continued to make his case against withdrawing, and it was clear that Trump had made up his mind throughout the rest of the day and the week, and over the weekend, preparations intensified for the withdrawal of announcement, particularly drafting the official presidential decision document to make sure there was no loopholes that supporters could crack th back through. Stephen Miller and his speechwriters were also working away at Trump's speech, which was progressing well. Trump had plenty to add, so the drafting went right into text that had been prepared for the teleprompters. Although he had aimed for Trump's announcement on May 7th, Sanders had told me that the First Lady had an event scheduled the day, so we moved the withdrawal to May 8th. There were thus our weighty matters of state deposed, and in fact, even there, Trump wavered, wondering about one date or another, literally until almost the last minute. There was a final perfunctory Trump May phone call on Iran and other issues on Saturday, May 5th, and Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson arrived in Washington Sunday night for further discussions. The night went well. Mattis sent me a declassified document at home, again opposing the withdrawal, but not but still not requesting a high level meeting to discuss it. I felt like saying that his position was well preserved and a well papered for a history, but I refrained. The Pentagon still was not telling the truth of what it would have to do operationally if the U.S. withdrew. Having moved it from overt opposition to a guerrilla warfare, it did not slow us down. I saw Johnson in my office at 9 a.m. Monday, having first met him in London in 2017, discussing Iran and North Korea at length. We received Trump's recent meetings with Macron and Macau, and Macron's Four Pillars idea. Johnson said that he had been thinking along the same lines. I said I would be happy to call the idea Johnson's Four Pillars, and we all laughingly agreed. He, like Macron, stressed Britain fully understood the existing deal's weaknesses, which would have been surprising to most supporters who still worshipped at its altar. I explained why the announcement would be coming soon, although knowing Trump, I did not say it would be the next day. We would not just simply lasp, lasp into an action. Um, but would bring back force in an all-nuclear-related U.S. sanctions the deal had been put on ice. As we parted, I reminded Johnson that I had said to him the previous summer that I want to help out on Brexit, Brexit and still did, although we had little chance to talk about it. I spoke with Sedwell about this conversation and was later on the phone with Antain when he assumed that Trump had just tweeted, I will be announcing my decision on the Iran deal tomorrow from the White House at 2 p.m. No suspense left there. And time had been waiting Trump's watching Trump's tweets more carefully than I, there was little doubt what was coming, which I feared to Israeli ambassador Ron Demmer and others. Not that anyone needed much explanation. On D-Day itself, Trump called China's Xi Jinping at 8.30 a.m. on several issues, including North Korea. Trump said that he would be making a statement on Iran shortly and asked, almost in a childlike child way, if Jing wanted to know if he wanted what he would say. Xi said that it sounded like Trump wanted to tell him a completely on-target insight. Trump said, why not, Moment said, and then feeling trust and confiding in Xi said he was terminating the nuclear deal, which was not bad and that we would have seen what happened. Xi said he would keep the news confidential, adding simply that U.S. knew China's position, meaning Xi did not plan to make a major bilateral issue. Macron called and asked what Trump planned to say on Iran, but Trump wanted to make sure that, uh, that Macron would be circumspect. He admonished Macron not to make to not make it public, asking for Macron's word. Macron replied affirmatively, believing that, that the Iran should not leave the deal, nor would France as they worked to achieve a comprehensive new deal. As the two leaders had discussed previously, Trump didn't think Iran would exit because they were making too much money. Trump mused that at some point that he should meet with Iran, Iranian President Rouhani, flattering Macron as the best of the Europeans, and that he should tell Rouhani Trump was right. Trump delivered the speech at about 2.15 p.m., which went according to script with Pence, Mnuchin, Ivanka, Sanders, and myself in attendance. Afterward, we all walked back to the Oval Office feeling things had gone as office planned and that the speech was well received. In a few minutes after 2.30, I conducted a close encounter with reporters in the White House briefing room, which had been on record but not on camera so that the media pictures would be appropriately of the president giving a speech so that we were done. 
It had taken one month to shred the Iran nuclear deal, showing how easy it was to do once something, somebody took the events in hand. I did my best to prepare our allies, Britain, Germany, and France for what had happened, because they had s seemed completely unready for a possible U.S. withdrawal. A lot remained to be done to bring Iran to its knees or to overthrow its regime. Trump's stated policy, to the contrary notwithstanding, was where we are off to a great start. For several months after the withdrawal, work proceeded to follow up on Trump's decision to reimpose economic sanctions and to take another step uh, to increase pressure on the Tehran consistent with the his decision to withdraw from the nuclear deal. Basically, the initial plan was to bring back into effect the previous sanctions suspended by Obama's nuclear deal and then make adjustments to close loopholes, increase enforcement activity, and turn the campaign into maximum pressure on Iran. By July 26, it was time to hold a Restricted Principles Committee meeting to see how we were doing, which we did at 2 p.m. in the sit room. The most interesting part was meeting with Mattis's effort to downplay the overall importance of Iran and the international threat mix, he said, with the U.S. He said, Russia, China, and North Korea were bigger threats, although his response reasons were vague, and I was pleased to see Pompeo and Mnuchin both push back. Given that Iran was one of the top four threats identified in the national security, Trump had approved before my arrival, but the ghost of Mattis's protest protestations about the Iran about Iran seriously would dog us right until the end of 2018 when he departed and beyond so momentum momentous was this meeting that it leaked to the press and it was reported on the next day in the meantime Iran's currency was dropping through the floor in mid August 2018 and then again in January 2019 I traveled to Israel to meet with Netanyahu and other Israeli officials on a range of issues especially Iran the existential this was existential for Israel, and Netanyahu had become the leading strategist on rolling back Iran's nuclear weapons and ballistic missile programs. He also clearly understood the regime's change was far and away the most likely thing to predominantly after Iran's behavior. Even though it was not Trump's administration declared policy, it certainly would have happened in the facts of the sanctions had held. Moreover, given the views that the Middle East Arab oil producing states, there was and had been tacitly for years agreement on the common threat Iran posed to them among Israel and themselves, albeit for different reasons. This Iran consensus was also contemporaneously made making p possible a new push to resolve the Israel Palestine dispute, which strategically could very much benefit America. Whether we could make these new alignments operationally, of course, was very different. But early September, attacks on the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad and the U.S. Consult in Basra, undoubtedly, in my view, by Shia militia groups acting on Iran's behest, revealed new tensions with the administration, as many in the state and defense resisted forceful responses. The willingness to retaliate thereby, increasing the cost of the attackers, and hopefully deterring them in the future reflected the hangover of Obama-era policies. Even 20 months into the Trump presidency, new appointees and new policies were not yet in place. If it were still early 2017, the problem might have been understandable, but the sheer malpractice of the bureaucratic inertia persisted in such critical policy areas. The debate over responding to these sort of attacks lasted right in through my tenure. Because of the obstructionism and Trump's impulsive desires to reduce America's troop presence in the region leaded uniformly to a more passive direction for all that Trump hatred about the Obama administration. It was no small irony that his own idiosyncratic views simply reinforced the bureaucracy's existing tendencies, all to the detriment of U.S. interest in the Middle East more broadly. I also was troubled by the Treasury's unwillingness to bear down on Iran's participation in the global financing financial messaging system known as SWIFT. There was considerable interest among congressional Republicans in stopping Iran's continued connection to the system, but Mnuchin and Treasury have Rejected. They had understandable concerns, but invariably they had pushed for no change on the existing policy, the characteristic attribute of the bureaucratic inertia, and the real answer was to squeeze Iran even harder to work for more ways to comprehensively monitor Iran, not to give it a pass simply to continue with monitoring mechanisms that could be replaced and perhaps even improved with a little effort. The NSC staff and I kept pushing on this, largely behind the scenes, and succeeded later in the year, but even more difficult obstacles to our Iran policies emerge in the coming year. So guys, that's chapter 3 of John Bolton's book, The Room Where It Happened. Thanks for listening.